Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. My name is J.D. Kilbride. Uh, I'm honored to present this material to you today. <coughs> All right, this is level two, week three. Uh, the name of this uh, training is Fall of Satan and Angels. All right, the introduction. Before the earth and the age of man, there was God, and only his will prevailed. The angels, sometimes called stars from heaven, were created later by God to serve him as free-willed spiritual beings, holy and without sin. One angel who stood above the rest, Lucifer, brought forth the existence of sin into the universe and incited a rebellion. The angels who remained obedient continued to carry out his will. After the rebellion, Lucifer and the angels who followed him fell from their holy estates and now stand in active opposition to the work and plan of God. Believers often ignore Satan's existence and power or overemphasize it. It is only through the word of God that we can gain a biblical understanding and balance in these last days. Um, a preacher that I used to really like a lot and still do, uh, he used to talk about Christians giving Satan way too much credit, you know, uh, blaming everything from a flat tire to, you know, when you mention, he, he said, and I've, many times I still believe this, if I mention his name and give him credit, then I give him power. I give him power over a believer that he doesn't really have. He's a defeated foe. All right, these are the lesson objectives. Students will be able to gain an understanding as to, one, the nature of angels as God's created spiritual beings, two, the existence and personality of Satan, three, the fall of angels, their time and cause, four, our attitude towards Satan, our conquered enemy. God created all angels. The Bible reveals that God has an everlasting kingdom in heaven and earth and has created spiritual beings called angels. Angels were originally created as anointed servants. Their mission was to carry out his will, offer up praises, guard his throne, and deliver messages to his people. Angels are created beings. God created angels as angelic spiritual beings for his service and work in the kingdom. They are ministering spirits not limited to the physical or material realm as man is. Can anyone read Psalm 148? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him sin and moon, oh sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the sky. Let the praise, let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And can someone read Nehemiah 9, 6? You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all the starry hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything in the multitudes of heaven, worship you. Colossians 1, 6, please. Someone else. Um, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him are all things hold together. B. Angels are created with free will. Angels, like men, were created with a free will, having the, the power of choice. They could choose to obey and follow God's will or not. You know, I was a little surprised by that when I started to read the material, and then I thought, well, of, of course they have free will. You know, Satan led one-third of the angels to, to a rebellion against God. Okay, could someone read Isaiah 14, 12? How do you have fallen from heaven, one in star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid down the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephyr. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. The prophet is literally talking about the king of Babylon who had become proud, believing that he had conquered the world. We can draw a comparison between this verse 
and Luke 10, 18, when Jesus says he saw Satan like, fall like lightning. Spiritually speaking, he draws a comparison between what happened to this king and what happened to Lucifer. That's in Daniel 4, 28, 33. All right, will somebody read 2 Peter 2, 4 for me? For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Would somebody read Jude 1, 6, please? And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. Purpose of angels. The word angel in scripture refers to supernatural or heavenly beings whose purpose is to act as God's messengers to men and his agents carrying out his will. Would someone read Hebrews 1, 5 through 7, please? For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says that all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flame as a fire. The sun is superior to the angels. Expound on that. Okay, so the sun, not sons, it's singular. The sun. Yeah, right. so referring to this Hebrews 1, for which of the angels did God ever say? He didn't say anything this about them. He said this about his son. Mm -hmm. And he says this in quote, You are my son. Mm -hmm. Today I have become your father. Or again, he says another quote, I will be his father and he will be my son. So these are two different quotes. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, okay, now that's something different. Now the manifestation of Jesus becoming incarnate, this is something else that happens. He says, now let all the angels worship him. All means all, not some. Okay? Seven. Verse seven. And speaking of the angels, now he's referring to the collective whole. He makes his angels spirits and servants of flames of fire. So they're basically ministering spirits. They do his bidding uh, for his will. So in this verse, he's showing that the son who would become the son of God, who would be manifested in the Jesus, the locals who would become word, He's superior than every angel ever created. Because they're created beings. Jesus is not created. He is of God, same nature, just came into the world and put on human flesh for the purpose of redemption, which we would over the last week with a class on redemption. And so here, speaking that the Son is superior, the book of Hebrews in every chapter is going to go on that he's even superior to, to the priesthood. This whole earlier chapters of Hebrews just goes on how the Son is more superior. You're looking at the old covenant, that's great, but God says, now is the language of my son. That's the first three verses before we read this. He's speaking now the language of son. Listen to the son. And he's showing that the son is superior. So that's what the note reflects, that the son is superior in his ministry, in his purpose, why he came onto the earth. And he said, all angels, worship him as he comes onto the earth. And we read that. Mm -hmm. that the angels, the first thing they say in the announcement is to worship him. And you see the shepherds, their response was worship. You see the angels, you hear that. Mm -hmm. It's recorded for us. They began to worship. So it's a manifestation. The, the word of God is supporting this. It's not arbitrarily putting it out there as an opinion. All right, Daniel 9, 20 to 22. The 70 sevens. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. That's, reference, that's in reference uh, to the archangel Gabriel. Would someone read Luke 1, 26, 33? In the sixth month of, this, um, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a, a, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. 
The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will receive and give birth to a son, and you are called. You will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's house, uh, over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Oh, then, the, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are called called to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring many back many back many people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents toward their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So just notice quickly, we covered several areas as you can see in point three on your handout. Um, in verse 17, we just read right there. I, I would like to emphasize that he, this was prophetic to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Nobody was following his ways. The Old Testament attests to how they kept falling away from God repeatedly, yeah. Yeah. repeatedly. And then for 400 years, there was silence. So now that the Messiah had just been born, and now that this was referring to um, the coming of the, the Messiah and also of John the Baptist, his ministry of John the Baptist would be, think of that, that's John the Baptist at this point as well. We move from Jesus to John the Baptist, that he will be turning the hearts of the parents to their children. What John's position was of calling people back unto Christ, it's no different than us to go and make disciples. Our job, in reference, is the same job title, job description, to turn the hearts of the parents back to their children. But that's by letting them know how much God loved them receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, and the effects of being transformed by that message will turn their hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, the righteousness that God will reveal, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And if you read throughout all the New Testament, that's what the bride does. She's making herself ready. And so I, when I saw that, I said, that's so powerful that we, we look at it, we read it, and we miss that in the New Covenant, that effect became part of your job description as a church collectively and also individually, what we do. So I thought it was very powerful. Okay, the ministry of angels. The function of angels is to worship and serve God in addition to hearkening to the voice of the heirs of salvation. We are the heirs of salvation. Okay, Psalms 103, 21 to 22. Um, Praise the Lord all his heavenly hosts, you are his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his, in his dominion. Okay, Hebrews 1, 13, 14, to which the angels did God say, ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Are not the angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. And then Acts 21, 7, 10 to 10. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And the angel, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. 
He passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the, to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Can we back up to, to which of the angels did God say, come sit on my right, right hand, and I'll make your enemies a footstool? Right. Well, he was referring to, in other words, he's saying, I didn't tell the angels, I only told one, that was God, that was my son Christ. Right, right. correct. Yes? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. And what's Fascinating about that, if you just sit there for a minute and just think of a panoramic view of the entire New Testament, this was prophetic. It's being recorded. It had to be fulfilled. So when Christ came in his ministry for three and a half years, he was able to conquer Satan, you know, through the cross. Um, sin and death was paid for. He was resurrected. So God was able to prove that this was not just words to be accomplished. He was a martyr. But he was able to raise his son, and that would be the receipt for the heirs of salvation. But then he had to be received into glory. And at that point, his glorification, that's a part we don't hear too much about in sermons or teachings. That glorification, sit at my right hand, makes him now, he received the authority. He became the king of kings, lord of lords. He has a throne to sit on. The work is finished. So when he says, sit at my right hand, there are portions of ministry his mission that he had to accomplish and once accomplished okay now you've received you've accomplished here's the reward and I'll, i'm all over in my study so one thing i will mention is in revelations it says that he received the kingdom he was given a crown and this crown wasn't a, a crown of um a kingly crown it was a crown of triumph okay and the difference is once you understand that crown that he received you understand that he when he was glorified in heaven, he was triumphant. And that's why he received the victor's wreath for winning a victory. And that's important. And he also has a kingly crown, which means he has the authority to sit on that throne, but he received what he accomplished, the finished task. So just something for, for thought about sitting at that right hand of God that's powerful mm -hmm. because he was able to receive the authority that he said before he left. All authority and power has been given to me. Now go and give his commission. But in his glorification, he was on the throne and receive that victor's crown there in, in glory. Mm. Something to consider that we don't, we don't hear preached. Mm -hmm. But it is very, very biblical. All right, there are four angels that are directly mentioned in the Bible. The angel Gabriel, appeared. he appears twice to the prophet Daniel, once to the priest Zechariah, and lastly to Mary. He stands in the presence of God. Exhib exhibits supernatural powers. He comes in flight and is able to remain, to make man mute. Uh, and the archangel Michael appears in, in four passages of scripture and is described as one who engages in heavenly warfare. He is referenced, he's referred to as one of the chief princes, much like a general, which implies there is a hierarchy in heaven's hosts and one who works to protect God's people. He's often thought to be the one who changed the dragon, the ancient serpent who the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years in Revelation 21. God. Amen. The angel Lucifer, also known as Satan, the devil, he was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, anointed as a guardian cherub, for so he was ordained cut down for rebelling against his creator God. On earth, Satan has been given temporary reign as prince of the power of the air. He is at work in the sons of disobedience. He has control of this world as its God, masquerading as the angel of light, leading the whole world astray. He is a thief. He's a murderer and the father of lies. If that isn't obvious today, I just don't know. I just don't know what people are thinking of. The angel Abaddon, only mentioned once, appears to be a fallen angel ruling over the abyss. He is an instrument of judgment used by God during the end times. In Revelations 9, 1 through 3, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star has given the key to the shaft of the abyss. 
When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like, a, like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down to the earth and were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. And of course, the angel of the Lord. It is a name implied upon close study. We see that the angel of the Lord is God himself, Yahweh. We believe these appearances to be Christophanies, an appearance or a non-physical non manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. For example, in Exodus 3, 2 through 6, angel of the Lord appears to Moses in flames, with, in flames of fire within a bush. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And this Moses, at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Was there an, a, a Raphael? An angel? Raphael? I don't, I don't believe that's the I don't think so. Testament. I can double check that one for you. All right, would someone ring, uh, read 1 Kings uh, 19, 5 through 8 for me, please? And he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over the his over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank. And then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, <clears throat> Get up and eat, for the, for the journey is, is uh, too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Harav, the, the mountain of God. Okay, so here's the answer to your question about there is no mention of the angel Raphael in the Bible. What it comes from is actually from one of the apocryphal books of the old like the Catholics that use that. So it's in there, and it's called the book of Tobias. It's in that book. It's in the Catholic Bible. Okay. So when you hear, if you heard about it, that's exactly where it comes from. Is, is it valid? We don't know that to be true. The Bible definitely doesn't endorse it. Could be, maybe, but it's not inspired, so I wouldn't give it more credit than necessary because we may start following stuff that is um, not biblical and can lead to believing things that God's Word isn't affirming okay. or endorsing. All right, the fall of angels. It is necessary to understand what the Bible teaches about the origin and fall of Satan and its effects on humanity. In the beginning of the history of man, we see Satan's defiance to God, which brought deception to man. Satan's pride led to covetousness, self-will, and selfish desires that turned his free will against the will of God. God created the angel Lucifer. Lucifer, the anointed cherub, was created by God, great in wisdom and beauty. He was charged with protecting or covering God's throne and leading worship. The name Lucifer means day star, son of the morning, or light bearer. All right, would someone read Ezekiel 28, 12 through 16 for me? I will. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyra and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Very precious stone adorned you carnelian, crystallite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. <laughs> Your settings and mountains uh, were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God who walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mouth of God and I expelled you, guardian terror, from among the fiery stones. Lucifer became Satan. Pride, vanity, and jealousy 
grew within Lucifer and caused him to rebel. He desired to us usurp God himself. According to the word, he managed to entice a third of the heavenly host to join him. A great battle ensued. Lucifer was ca cast down to the earth, thus becoming Satan as we know him today. In the Hebrew, meaning adversary, in the Greek he is he's known as the devil, meaning accuser. Lucifer is the original sinner. It was his desire to place his will above God's that introduced sin and disobedience into the universe. We don't know how long Lucifer served his purpose, but for the concept of time as we know it, it is not the same as God's. Can someone read Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 for me. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, sun of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Luke 10, 18, he replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. And Jesus is speaking to the 72 he had sent to proclaim the kingdom. Would you like to elaborate, John? So, remember he sent out the 12 and he sent out the 70. Some translations say 72. So in e either event where the number is 70, 72, we know that He's saying that as the gospel goes forth, the message goes forth, he's seeing Satan fall from like lightning. Now what's interesting, it already happened. However, there is a final um, kicking out, if I can say, of heaven. Because if we read in Job's time, he still had access to come before the Lord with his accusations. But at the moment that Jesus came and fulfilled his finished work, he no longer can come before God to do that accusation. He's been hurled down to the earth, where now he comes to us or his minions come to us and accuse us to our faces and how we deal with that accusation is a part of our walk. Mm. And so that's where that's important for us to know. Later on, scripture will elaborate on that. He's the accuser of the brethren and he comes to you, but we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So it's the word that we speak, that we believe, that we confess. And he comes now to our faces to accuse us. But the, the wiles of the devil will only uh, be demonstrated by our own sin, uh, our own sinful nature. We won't accept what the devil has to offer except when we are in that carnal mindset of allowing the devil to impact us. So that authority uh, is a very clear choice. If I'm going to go with my sinful nature, or I'm going to go with the devil behind me, or I'm going to go with a, a bold nature of Christ. So that was something that I, I really got out of it, that the devil can only hit you where That's you right. are weak. Well, well, we know that Jesus described him as a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. So we, we got the job description real clear. And as we move through the scriptures, we realize that what Jesus came to do was to defeat this foe, and there will be a final victory that will come to uh, its conclusion when he returns. But until then... He's empowered the body of Christ to know that they've overcome sin, sin never died. Uh, sin is no longer your master. Mm -hmm. So when Satan does come at you, you know, he tells us in Ephesians that we do have the armor of God, not only to protect us from sinning, but to guard your heart, to guard your mind. Mm -hmm. And there's a weapon to speak the word, and it's your offensive weapon, the word of God itself. So in this walk, uh, it's warfare, it's spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. So it's consistent. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 28, 15 through 17. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness found, was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I make you a spectacle before the kings. Fallen angels become demons. Fallen angels are the messengers and servants of Satan, the old devil. Upon their descent, they became demons, evil spirits under Satan's control. In the Bible, they are called principalities, powers, 
rulers of darkness and wicked spirits. Okay, Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. Put on the full armor of God for that you, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Yes. Um, are we supposed to put the armor on every day? I've heard uh, both ways. Put on every uh, day. That's a very good on. question. So a, a lot of times, I've been taught this over the years, and I've really studied this matter out uh, in the last decade. Putting on the armor of God uh, is not like putting on a costume. If we think of it every day, we have to put on a costume, then we're missing something because we're thinking it, we're thinking about it like spiritual clothing. You've already been clothed with the righteousness of God, so you do have that. So it's, it's a conviction. Do you know that you're righteous now? And if you believe that, then when the attacks of the enemy comes to say, that, look at what you've done, you're not righteous. I don't care what the word of God says. There's an accusation. You need to guard your mind and your heart, but you need to maybe ask yourself, I'm not righteous because of what I've done. I'm righteous because it's a gift given to me that I've received. So it's not about your performance. After you're saved, your performance is a work of the Holy Spirit to help you live a godly life. So putting on the armor of God is knowing and believing what the gospel truly says of you. And now the armor of God is to protect that which you now possess. And if you're not guarding your mind, someone's going to try to rob you of the truth because they'll come in with half-baked truth with lies mixed in to misdirect you. And the moment you let down your guard and allow that lie to come in, they're going to use the word of God to lead you astray. So you need to guard your heart, guard your mind. That's a part of it. The shield of faith, you need that. right? You need the gospel of peace on your feet to wherever you walk. You know you still have peace with God because you've received the righteousness of God and you've been declared justified. That's Romans 5.1. So uh, the armor of God is knowing and believing the truth as a whole so now that you believe that as a whole, you walk, that's your spiritual warfare. You're wearing it at all times based on what you believe. If it's a Batman belt you have to put on a costume every time there's an emergency, oh my God, I left that at home. No, you have to have that within you, that's what you believe. And that's why it's important that as believers who are now disciples, you need to know that word and know it well enough to guard you. It's not about, it's not about memorization. It's about understanding what it means and when the Lord awakens that, gives you a revelation, he peels back the layer, you just receive something that there's an encounter with that word that the Holy Spirit's ministering the truth that's life transforming. And you can go back to that scripture and it comes alive. And sometimes it, even in more layers because it continues to grow, produce fruit in you. So it's not a costume every day. Renewing your mind every day? Yes. You're always, that kind of... You're always updating your software. Where is the source? The Word of God. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Thank you for bringing it up. I'm always mindful when this question comes up, and we touched on it a few slides back, where Jesus used Scripture to combat Satan when he was in the, the wilderness for 40 days, and Satan was trying to use Scripture with, you know, like one degree off to try and tempt him, yes, and he true. would he would throw back Scripture at him. He, Absolutely you know, true. If, if Jesus needed Scripture to combat Satan, I know I do. You know. Absolutely, and he pulled it out of context. Yeah. But we have to be careful that we know what the scripture really says. There's a lot of out of context happening in church right now. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, most of it is out of context with an opinion. And after a while, that the opinion is believed to be gospel. We don't even question the opinion because we just collectively agree with the opinion. Yeah. And don't even realize the scripture really say that. Will somebody read Peter 3, 21 through 22 for me? And this water symbolizes bap baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a, of a clear conscience towards God. It serves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is our God, right-handed with angels, authorities, and powers, and submissions to him. This water symbolizes baptism, but now saves you also. You always the, have a person uh, of I was expecting this one. <laughs> I was expecting it. I was expecting it. So the answer is right in the scripture. Let me let me read it to you so you see it. And this water 
symbolizes, and now we're talking about symbolism, not actual water, symbolizes baptism that now saves you. What? Okay, so what kind of baptism are we talking about since he says it symbols, oh, it's a symbolization of water? The answer is, it's not the removal of dirt. In other words, real water that you put on you can remove dirt mm -hmm. from the body. But, there's the answer, but the pledge of a clear, a, clear, a clear conscience from God. How do you get this clear conscience from God? By receiving Christ as Lord and Savior, and your sins have been forgiven. So this baptism he's referring to is really the Romans 6 encounter, that you've died now to sin. And this baptism that Romans 6 talks about is a baptism into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And that is what cleanses your conscience when you receive him. And now you're dead to sin. You've been truly forgiven. Now you've been empowered to live a godly life. What Peter says in this verse is not about water. It's about being transformed by real faith in Christ and receiving what he's done. You've been forgiven. All sins have been forgiven. That's, not, that's why it's not about water. And on the surface, we can read this and think he's talking about the ritual of baptism saves you. Not at all. The answer is right there. <coughs> not that we move the dirt, so it's not about water because it says it was symbolism, but it's about a pledge. A pledge from who? Not us. God's pledge to us that you will have a clear conscience toward God. Why? Because you don't have to feel guilty anymore about your sins. You've been forgiven. And it saves you that type of baptism. In other words, really receiving Christ. By what? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul says we're still lost in our sins. That's why it's so important we preach the resurrection. And it's that baptism of believing in his resurrection, what he's done, the finished work. All sins have been forgiven. You've been given the righteousness of God, and now sin is no longer your master. You can now live an empowered life. New, new heart, new spirit, Holy Spirit moves in. It's that type of baptism. That's a true, that's truly being regenerated. We spoke about that before in class. That's what regeneration really means. That's the baptism that saves. That all begins with who, what that we believe, who Christ did for us, what he did for us. Believing that in our heart. That's what causes us to be baptized into the Holy Spirit. Right. So the the ritual of getting wet and bored is just an outward declaration to everyone around us that we believe this truth that was declared to us, the gospel. But Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be. And once they've heard this good news, it becomes a treasure to them, or they reject this treasure. But if they receive this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the same word in Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, you speak with your mouth that what you believe in your heart. But then verse 10 says, because you've received it in your heart, what do you do? You confess with your mouth. So it starts with the heart. The message penetrates that heart of stone, cracks it. Well, you know it given a new heart of flesh because you've confessed this and the transformation takes place and that is the work of the Holy Spirit that's being I know I'm going to be uh, Christianese politically incorrect <laughs> they know me I knock over sacred crowds all the time that's what being baptized in the Holy Spirit is Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit not us laying hands on people to impart something that he's the true person who would, he's the baptizer mm -hmm. so when he baptizes in the Holy Spirit you've been born again because you believe something and confess this trust in him. That's what faith is, trust. I trust that you've accomplished this on my behalf. And this was the Father's plan that you finished. And now I get a chance to hear. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, that message of the gospel. You confess, I trust you. You are my Lord, my Savior. My sins are forgiven. So you can now have a clear conscience and be at peace with God. And Satan's going to come to rob and steal that peace. We know this. And then again, we go back to the arm of God. How do we protect our heart and our minds through what his word says that we have because of what he's done? Because he, regardless of whether you've been water baptized or not. Regardless. The thief on the cross had no time to get down and go right. for water baptism. Thank he was you. nailed to the cross. It wasn't going to happen. But Jesus said, at this day, you will be in paradise. So, so water baptism is just for man. So it, it's, it's, it's what the Lord commands. So he tells us to do so. What but does it tell us to do that? Well, in the, in the Great Commission, to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in other words, it's, it's in an ordinance. Like he wants us to, to do the Last Supper all the time, to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he wants us to also do the water baptism. But it's not water baptism that saves you. It's 
it's something you do to say to the world or say to the body believers around, I am a part of this body now. Mm -hmm. You do that not to join a club. You do that because it's an expression of, Lord, thank you. Thank you. And I want to participate in what you said. I want to go through the process of being water baptized. But the process doesn't save you. You've already been saved. The process is just a declaration. But to those around you collectively, I am a part of this body of Christ. Hmm. If one part of the body, meaning your toe, that you stubbed it, because it doesn't have a mouth, doesn't speak, say, well, I'm not a mouth. I can't speak, so you know what? I'm not a part of the body. No, you need your toe. Just cut your toe off. You ain't going to walk so well. You ain't going to have great balance. It is a part of the body. Every part is important. And so participating in water baptism is just following what Jesus said to do. Not that it saves, but now that you're saved, I want to let everyone know this is a declaration of my faith. That's all it really is. You make it more than that. You surely do. Yeah. We do. Absolutely. Okay. Peter 2, 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Would somebody read Revelation 12, 7 through 9 for me? Then the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. In Revelations 2, 22, uh, he sees the dragon and the ancient serpent, who is the devil of, or Satan, bound him for a thousand years. And then the note here says a thousand years, um, it's not to be taken literally. A thousand years is the age of the church. It says Satan was bound, but it does not say that he was rendered powerless or incapable of influencing others. So, in those two verses, and verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 2, has caused a lot of disruption to the body of Christ. If, if you guys didn't know it, um, throughout the church age, um, even until now, 2,000 years later, the church as a whole has at least four positions on the book of Revelations, how it's interpreted. And if you weren't aware of that, you can do some searching on that. And it really boils down to how do you view Revelations 20, the millennium, which really doesn't say the word millennium, it just says the word thousand years. The book itself says it's going to be signified. The root word, book was written in signs. Everything you read through there is not to be taken totally literal. But depending how you interpret Revelations 20, it's a literal thousand years, and it's where that thousand years takes place. Is it at his coming? Is it after his coming? And all these different things. But what we do know about the book of Revelation, it's given to comfort and it's promised to be a blessing to those who read and hear. Not only the future generation, but the persons who were the first recipients of the book. And, and chapter 20 says that, that thousand years is not to be taken literally. The reason why we wrote this is because it really symbolizes the church age. Now, that's one of the four schools of thought. So let me just make sure you're aware of that. But does say this specifically, so I don't care which interpretation you take. It does say that so that he would not deceive the nations. That what the bounding was specific to. It wasn't saying that Satan could no longer still kill and destroy. It was about deceiving the nations any longer. The binding was specific. And so no matter what your school of thought is, you have to accept that to be true. And that's one to make sure that we brought that out in its light. Let me make sure I explain this to you. When Jesus comes again, what we read in scripture is he wraps it up. When he finally comes, he wraps it up and there is a separation of goats and sheep. You can read that in the gospels parables where he talks about the kingdom when the son of man returns. So it's always about once he comes, final judgment. But there's interpretation saying that when he comes, he's gonna set up a kingdom and then for a thousand years he will reign. But in those interpretations, there are people who are still gonna reject him. There's still death. There's still sickness. That's being read into that. If you really sit there and think about what Scripture says, when he comes, there's going to be a judgment and a separation of goats. But the truth is, when he comes, what's going to happen? We see in here that in verse 2, this is before the thousand years, Satan was seized, that ancient serpent, so we know who it is, the devil. He was bound for a thousand years. And if I took that and started reading it further, 
Just, you know what, let me do that quickly so it doesn't seem like it's out of context. And one day, I will teach on Revelations on all four perspectives. Scares to death. No, I won't. You, the book promises to be a blessing. And if you get scared to death, maybe you need to check that interpretation. <laughs> but let's look at verse 20. Watch this. Now, chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Can a chain hold a spirit? A physical chain? No. So we know it's symbolism. But he had a key. Is it a physical key? No, but we know that a key means that there's authority, that I have access and I can close off and I can open. Verse 2 is what we read. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss. He closed it and put a seal on it so that he could no longer deceive the nations until, listen, until the thousand years was completed. And then after that, he must be released for a short time. So we have to take that. Jesus sets up this kingdom for a thousand years. He's come already. He's reigning on earth. And then he's released. I thought you were the king of kings and lords of lords. What happened here? Why is this guy able to? So you have to place that into a place. Okay, where, where, where is this thousand years? Is it before your coming? Is it in the middle of your coming? Is it after your coming? I've studied this out. My personal belief is that thousand years started at the moment Jesus left. And the church has been going through the onslaught of Satan's piss. That's what Revelation 12 says. And that he's going after the seed because the son left. And that seed is the church, us, the woman. And it's been ongoing for 2,000 years. The persecution and all those different things have been going on on and on until he finally comes. But before he finally comes, that releasing, the madness of him deceiving the nations, had, had will magnify. You can look at the world today. You can't believe how lost they are when the truth is explained to them. Mm -hmm. There's madness because they're totally of losing it. So you can almost see that to be true in today's day and age. And again, I'm not applying it because I see a situation that fits. This has been true for all time, but now his time is short and he must be released. Why? So that darker will get darker and the church will get brighter and brighter. And then the next verse says, Then I saw thrones and people sitting on them who were given authority to judge. And I also saw the people who had been beheaded because of their testimony. Persecution. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Will there be persecution in this new kingdom? That kind of rebellion happens in this new thousand year reign? Some interpretations say it will. But that's giving hope to people that I don't have to receive Christ now. I can wait until he comes, receive salvation during the millennial kingdom. That's giving them an excuse not to accept Christ now. Hmm. You see the door that it opens? It sets mm -hmm. up, yeah, I don't need him now, I can get him later. No, now's the day of salvation, because when he comes, that's it, it's over. We know that is biblical. So are we going to depend on the millennial kingdom to save people? According to those interpretations, the Holy Spirit's been removed. How can you be born again? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I can entertain this for hours. Yeah. But when he comes, mm -hmm. he's going to separate the sheep from the lamb. Right. Yeah. So right. all those people who are waiting... They're going to be separated before the thousand year begins. You're absolutely correct. And that's why I question these different positions based on what scripture really says. I don't, and really what it comes down to, and this is, this is a big thing. Majority of the positions are based on what do we do with Israel? That's the question. And so there's a... That's what the tribulation is going to design. Well, the question again is, tribulation is common to man. And then we also look at this word as a great tribulation. But it's been common to men. And the church going through any of these persecutions with the beheadings and cutting off that we just heard for the testimony of Christ, what are we saying? That that, testament, that, that tribulation wasn't great enough. There's going to be a greater one. It doesn't get any greater. They're dead and gone. And they're in heaven right now. Okay, And, and they're crying out to God for how long, O Lord, how long, O Lord, before you judge? Be at peace. Be at peace. I got this. It's my timing. But we're saying it wasn't great enough. There'll be a greater persecution. We're doing injustice to those who died already for their testimony in Christ. So I, 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 I look at all those different interpretations, and I'm very honest about their positions. And it comes down to, well, what do we do with Israel? Because they'll try to say, you're into replacement theory. But the question comes down to Israel. Scripture says this is the Israel of God. Those who are not believers now in Israel, I mean believers in Christ now that are in Israel, there's a blindness on them. But if they don't accept Christ, they're not born again yet, even though they're the people of God collectively. 
once they believe, they've been translated, we've all been engrafted into that one tree, into Christ himself. And so the question comes out, what do we do with Israel? Is, are they going to get a land promise? They, they get into all these different specifics and saying that you're saying that, well, the church and Israel are two separate. No, there's one. It's the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. For example, there is a 144,000. There is a multitude that can't be numbered. And I'll say, see, those are two different groups. There's a principle that runs throughout Revelations. If you never heard it, it's called, I heard, I saw. They were two inconsistent things, but they were one and the same. I heard lion, saw lamb. But when he turned around, he saw this lamb as if slain. Inconsistent, but one and the same. 144,000. I heard the number. When I turned to see, he saw what? A number that can't be, can't be counted. Well, 144,000 can't be counted. But that's not the big number. Mm -hmm. But they were one and the same, the same group. But well, what's the rapture all about? The, see, and that, that, that's another thing. When Jesus comes, this rapture, are we going to be taken? Are we going to be left behind? This became a mini Revelations class for a hot second. Sorry to go there, but... Cool. The, the, the whole thing with Revelations and rapture is when he comes, read, read some of the accounts that he said. He says, as in the days of Noah, okay, so, some will be taken away. But when you read those accounts in the Synoptic Gospel, the ones that were taken away were taken away in destruction. Those that were left behind were the ones that were in the ark. They were in Christ. Mm -hmm. We sometimes read into it, no, the ones that are taken away, the ones saved. So I don't want to confuse anyone, but when you read through those accounts, read what he's saying in all three accounts, like I did when we did the parables. I put three accounts side by side and look for mm -hmm. the details. You'll be surprised what you see and what you've been taught. And whether you believe we're going to be taken or left behind, we know that when he comes, it will be a separation. And it doesn't matter. We don't separate ourselves. He sends forth his angels to do the separation. Yeah. There are going to be goats and there are going to be sheep. There are going to be no hybrids. There's no shoats and there's no geek. There is only going to be either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. <clears throat> and Revelations 20 <laughs> takes a position to let us know that the binding is specific so he can no longer deceive the nations. Well, in the Old Testament, the only nation that knew of Christ, that knew of God, was Israel. So everyone else was blinded. Mm -hmm. But now everyone gets a chance to hear this gospel. So that binding is specific. They now can hear this gospel message. They can choose to wow. accept it or reject it. Paul went around. Went around. What did he do? He went to all the nations proclaiming it. So that blinding, they can now hear the gospel. Now most of Israel still doesn't believe in Christ. This is true to this day. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you do have a lot of Christians that are Jews. They're, you know, they're, they were oh, in yeah. the synagogue before well, here. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this is true. But a lot of it is cultural. Like, we have cultural Christians. Christians that grow up and say, I'm a Christian because I, I was raised a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Right. You said it last week, God don't have grandchildren. You're in the kingdom because you believe and receive. And you're a Jew culturally because you grew up in that environment. The works of Satan. Satan, unlike God, is not omniscient, omnipresent, nor omnipotent. But he, his emissaries who carry out his bidding are able to listen in, attack on his behalf, and carry out his will. Satan and his, and his servants are thieves who have come to steal, kill, and destroy humanity by attacking spirituality, by attacking spiritually, morally, mentally, physically, and emotionally. 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy and the, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, lion looking for someone to devour. Some activities they perform against God and man. One, they steal the word from the heart of man in Matthew 13, 19. Two, they blind the mind of unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Three, they pervert the word of God, 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. Four, they possess, seduce, and trouble people. First Chronicles 10, 13 through 14. Five, they torment and resist people. Zechariah 3, 1 through 3. Six, they tempt believers and mankind to sin. Genesis 3, 1, 5. The victory is ours. The word of the Lord tells us that believers are not to fear, for the Lord himself reveals the end of the story, for it is written in the book of Revelation, Revelation 20, 10. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is how the story ends. 
meditation and review. But to which the angel, ha the angels has, he ever said, "Sit at my right hand till I make you your enemies your footstool." Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews 1:13 through 14.